Guess what? I'm just about to leave on a four day kayaking and camping trip. And so I thought I would share with you the binoculars and monocular that I plan to take with me to test and the reasons why. And we're gonna start right now. Hello and welcome to Best Binocular Reviews. My name is Jason. Before we begin, I just wanted to say that while I wouldn't classify myself as an expert, I have been on my fair share of kayaking and canoeing trips over the years. Certainly one of the most memorable was way back in 2001, when both Sharon and myself went on a truly unforgettable four-day kayaking and canoeing camping trip down the mighty Zambezi River in Africa, and that was for our honeymoon. This trip was completely wild, camping rough along the route, and 20 years later we still subject our friends to stories of hippos, crocs, buffaloes, elephants, and much else. We have also done some rather frightening whitewater canoeing in Swaziland, as well as more leisurely kayaking and camping trips down the River Wye in Wales, as well as in southern France. So the point being is that I do feel I have a reasonable amount of experience in this area. And this, combined with my knowledge in binoculars and optics in general, meant that I feel that the, the process that I went through and the thoughts and decisions I came to when deciding which binoculars and monocular to take with me would be of use and of interest to others looking for a binocular for a similar type of use. For me, making sure that whatever binocular I take onto a canoe, kayak, raft, or any small boat on the water is 100% waterproof and fully sealed is a complete no-brainer. The good news is most well-built mid to high level instruments will be o-ring sealed and thus both air and watertight. However, if you're on a tight budget and shopping at the lower end of the market, you do need to be more careful to check and do make a uh, note of the exact wording used. So many binoculars, uh, cheap binoculars will be advertised as being weatherproof or in this case, uh, water resistant. This doesn't mean they're fully sealed and uh, thus in my opinion, wouldn't be suitable for use. A good way to check and to be make sure is to, is to check if the binocular is actually also advertised as being fog proof. The reason I say this is in order to make the instrument fog proof, the manufacturer will fill it with either argon or nitrogen gas, which protects the inner glass surfaces from fogging up because there's, there's no moisture within it. But in order to keep that gas within inside the binocular, they obviously have to have seals um, that will prevent the gas from escaping. And thus, if the gas can't escape, those seals also ensure that water can't get into the binocular you know, at a certain depth. Once you get uh, deeper in water, obviously the pressure builds up and then water could leak into it. But the seals should be strong enough for use on a kayak or canoe. Um, I wouldn't take them deep sea diving or anything like that. So even on the calmest of days, on a slow meandering river, a platform like a canoe or a small boat is never gonna be as secure as that on solid ground. Now the problem with this in relation to a magnified view that you get through a binocular is the fact that that magnification also magnifies any sort of movement. Now on dry land you can sort of tolerate this or, or keep it to a, a minimum by obviously your, your feet should be firmly placed on the ground and you, all you have to do is worry about is that little bit of movement in your hands. Now on a boat this um, is, is, is much harder to do because not only do you have to worry about that movement in your hands, but you know, you'll be either sitting or kneeling down in a canoe which will be um, rocking about. Now, and, and the combination of both makes it really difficult to get a clear view of what you want to look at. So it's for this reason that most dedicated marine binoculars, you know, something like these Fujinons here, have a moderate magnification and usually around seven times as it just makes it that much easier to keep an image more steady um, and, and, and thus whilst it is tempting to go for a high magnification all the time because you want to see further away, um, it ends up that it becomes so shaky that you can't actually get a good view of what you want to see. So um, this is for this reason that I would suggest and I would only consider binoculars um, for canoeing or kayaking, kayaking excuse me, that have a magnification of around eight times or less. Not only is the available space fairly limited on any canoe or kayak that I've been on, but I think combining what is a fairly large and heavy instrument, along with these cramped conditions, as well as the fact that you're kneeling or sitting down and holding onto an oar or a paddle, is a fairly bad idea and will become quite annoying quite quickly. And so whilst undoubtedly a full-size binocular like these will produce a better low light performance and possibly a better optical performance overall, I completely eliminated them from my selection pool when choosing which binoculars I was going to take with me on my kayaking trip. 
Now in the past, I've mostly used a compact binocular like these when canoeing or kayaking. However, this time, I've decided to also include a number of mid-sized binoculars into the mix. Now there are two main reasons for this. Firstly, I want to maintain as good a low light performance and general optical performance as possible, and thus the larger objective lenses that you get from a mid-sized binocular help facilitate this. Then, as well as this, this time we are fortunate in that we have a company that's going to pick up our gear every day and transport it further on down the river, and thus our canoes won't be quite as full as they would be or what they have been in the past. So I can afford to just take it just that little bit more. So I think for most people, a mid-sized binocular could make a good uh, compromise between the size and weight of an instrument as well as the optical performance. And you know, generally on a boat, I think as you can see from here, a mid-sized binocular is not too much bigger than, than some compact binoculars. So you're not sacrificing too much, but what you do gain in return is um, quite a lot of features and optical performance that you, you can't find on most compacts. So I do feel that they are worth considering. Um, another point, just to put across quickly, is um, something that I hadn't actually thought of uh, initially, but um, was pointed out to me when I acquired at Opticon um, on, on a binocular that I was interested in. They said, why don't you take a monocular? Now, um, this could work out really well um, for many people. For a start, you can pretend you're a pirate, <laughs> because that's awesome. But uh, secondly to that, a monocular is essentially half a binocular. In fact, it's less than half a binocular because it doesn't have the focus wheel and, and things like that. So if you get the right one, and I will go through this one in more detail a bit later, you can not only you can use it one-handed, as you can see, um, it's, a, it's far smaller than a binocular. And on top of that, yet it still has a reasonably large objective lens. You know, this is a 30 millimeter lens here, yet it's not going to really take up any more space than a full compact. You know, and these only have 25 millimeter objective lenses. So for kayaking, canoeing, I think, um, and I'm yet to try it out yet, but I do feel that a, a monocular could op offer a really good solution and, and something well worth considering. However, do just keep in mind that as good as a monocular is in terms of saving weight and size, yet still maintaining a reasonable low light performance, you're never going to, in my experience, receive the same level of immersion that you get from using two eyes as opposed to one. And thus, for me, a monocular is more about um, obtaining information, you know, some important information like spotting out, you know, what's out over there or, or something like that, as opposed to actually enjoying that information. So, for instance, if I was to be, you know, interested in wildlife and birding ex uh, on the shore, um, I feel, and I, I will confirm this once I get back to you, um, after the trip, I do feel that a binocular will just offer a bit more of immersion and pleasure as opposed to the just information gathering that I get from a monocular. No matter how careful you are, whichever instrument you choose is more than likely going to get knocked about a bit when kept on a canoe or kayak. And thus, I always keep half an eye on the materials used in its construction and look out for things like magnesium or metal chassis and metal parts as opposed to cheap plastic ones as I just feel that it will ensure that the binocular that I have is just a little bit more robust and longer lasting. Also, do keep in mind that the binocular that you do choose, is, and once again, no matter how careful you are, is more than likely going to be exposed to quite a lot of sunlight in combination with getting wet and dry again. Now, if you're a sea kayaker or you know whatever, if you're going to be on, on the sea, you also have to throw into the mix salty sea spray. Now, all of these factors combined in my experience, play havoc with the uh, rubberized coatings on binoculars and with the sun uh, drying them out um, and they can often crack up and, uh, and break away. Or in other um, examples I have is the actual rubber coating becomes soft and tacky. And thus, this is something definitely to keep in mind of when selecting a binocular, especially ones that you're going to be using quite often um, in a watery environment. Another really nice feature to look out for when selecting your kayaking or canoeing binocular, um, it's probably not essential but nice to have, would be ones that are described as having oil or in this case more importantly aquaphobic lens, exterior lens coatings. These coatings are often combined with uh, hardened exterior lens coatings and thus me it means that not only are your lenses better protected against scratching, which once again, you know, flopping about in your canoe or boat can be really important, but any water that um, uh, hits onto the lens, be that from you know rain or, for example, sea spray or, or the like, will simply sheet simply sheets off the front of the of the lens itself, and thus you are able to achieve a, a much better view, even even though the the lens is continuously getting wet. On top of this, 
unprotected lenses, when water actually goes onto the lens and then dries, you're often left with a, a water stain and, and likewise with oil. So, so for example, your, your thumbprint, um, the oil on your, on your skin often gets left behind on the lens. And thus it means you have to clean the, the actual lens far more often than on protected lenses. Um, the advantage of this is the less cleaning of your lens you have to do, obviously the better. And then on top of that, even when you do have to clean the lens, um, those that are protected means that you, you have to actually apply a lot less force, which just um, further ensures that the, the view that you get through your binoculars is maintained at the optimal level for a much longer period of time, or indeed indefinitely. Just one point to um, uh, uh, put across here though, these uh, specialist lens coatings are generally only found on, on more expensive products. So if you're shopping on a budget, these are probably something that you're, you're not going to be able to find. So um, that's why I sort of started off by saying it, it's not essential because in reality, um, you know, you're not going to find a, a huge selection of binoculars with these specialist coatings on them. So how much should you be spending on your kayaking binoculars? Well, as always, my answer to this is it depends. Um, and in this case, it depends on a number of factors. But chiefly, I would say don't spend more than you can afford to lose or at least replace. Um, but having said that, it's also important to keep things into perspective. So for example, if you're going on a once in a lifetime trip uh, down the river and you are probably never gonna use your binoculars ever again, then my suggestion to you is you probably shouldn't spend as much or invest as much money into the product as someone who's gonna be doing it often or perhaps using the binoculars um, after the trip for a different use. So for example, Perhaps you want to buy a pair of binoculars for a canoeing trip. It's, it's stimulated to buy a pair of binoculars, but then after it, you may take up or start enjoying birding or wildlife observation or whatever. In that case, you, my advice generally is to, you know, spend what you can afford to lose, for example, but at the same time, keep in mind how often you're going to use the product. If you're going to be canoeing very often, then you're more than likely should spend a bit more money on a binocular that is specifically designed for that sort of a watery environment and, and make sure that it will last over a long period of time. But however, if you're just going on a once in a lifetime trip and you're never going to use your binoculars again, then I, I would suggest that your budget should be much lower unless you've just got money to burn. Having said all that, do also keep in mind why exactly you're getting these binoculars in the first place, and that is to get a better view. And there's no doubt that better quality binoculars will almost always outperform lower quality ones. So there's definitely a balance to be had. And I do have a video that goes through the differences between cheap and expensive binoculars, which I will link to down in the description below. So whilst I can't give you an exact figure, what I have done is ensured that my selection consists of binoculars in varying price categories, which I hope will help you in making your decision. So first up are these Steiner Navigator Pro 7x30 binoculars that I do really like the look of and I'm really excited to test them out. As from their list of features and specifications, to me they do look like they could become the ultimate binocular for kayak and canoeing. Highlights include a 7x magnification, which is obviously ideal for image stability on the water. They also include Steiner's sports autofocus system, which means once you have set up each of the diopters on each of the eyepieces, no further focal adjustments are necessary, and thus all images will remain sharp and in focus from their minimum focal distance of about 20 meters right up to infinity. Which, obviously, when you're on a boat and, and juggling an oar or a paddle, um, along with a pair of binoculars, just makes them that much easier to use. Filled with nitrogen under pressure, they are not only fog-proof, but also waterproof to a depth of 5 meters. These marine binoculars also contain Steiner's hydrophobic nanoprotection coatings on the outer lenses, which allows water to just simply sheet off them. Steiner also uses their special Macrolon housing on this instrument that is said to withstand over 11 Gs of impact. They also have a floating prism system that is able to absorb severe shock without getting damaged. And lastly, Steiner uses their MBR long life rubber on these that is designed to withstand sun and salt water environments without perishing. Priced at around $350 or pounds, these Steiner binoculars are my high-end choice and will be suitable for the more serious or professional kayaker or canoeist looking for a high-performance, long-lasting binocular that will not only withstand but relish whatever you throw at them. For more details and where to buy etc, please just follow the link down in the description below. The next instrument I'm taking are these Optocron Savannah WP 6x30 binoculars. Priced at around $130 or £120, 
These Optochrome binoculars are my lower cost or entry level choice. I really like the low 6x magnification and I'm interested to see how much of a difference this makes when out on the water. With its comfortable poroprism shape, narrow minimum interpapillary distance setting or IPD setting and a lightweight body, I feel as well as adults this will make a great option for children and I will be letting my 9 year old daughter use it on our kayaking trip. Other highlights include an extremely wide field of view, a lightweight body that has been filled with nitrogen and thus make them both fog and waterproof and on top of this they have a fully multi-coated optical system. Once again for more details and where to buy take a look for the link in the description down below. I will also be taking this Optocron WP 8x30 monocular. When I contacted Optocron inquiring as to if they would send me their Savannah WP 6x30 binoculars, they were the ones who actually suggested to me that I should also try out this monocular as they were sure it would fit the requirements perfectly. And taking a look at some of their features and specifications I can see why. To begin with they are far more compact and lightweight than an equivalent 30mm binocular and on top of this they can be used with one hand which is ideal when you are also paddling. So as small as a compact but with a larger lens means that they should be better in low light conditions. As well as this this monocular is nitrogen gas filled with a fully waterproof construction, they have a fully multi-coated optical system and a wide field of view. Costing around £110 or $140 this could well be the ideal option for those who want a small easy to use instrument but at a budget friendly price. Once again for far more details as well as where to buy please check out for the link down in the description below. So there you have it. On my return I do plan on following up this video with another where I'll go over my thoughts and opinions on each of the instruments that I took with me. But until then take a look in the description where I'll have a link that'll take you through to the BBR website where I'll list a bunch of other binoculars that I've fully tested and reviewed and which I honestly believe are also be an excellent choice for canoeing and kayaking. So I'll leave it there for now but I would just lastly like to say if you found this video useful or interesting I would really appreciate a thumbs up. And if at all possible please do remember to subscribe as this really does help both myself and this channel to continue to bring you more and more content in the future. And so and then lastly just before I go um, if you have any comments questions or ideas for future videos or whatever please feel free to use the comment section down below and I'll do my very best to get back to you. So until next time I'll see you again soon. Cheers for now. <laughs>